Thanks, Emma. Um, so, yeah, my name's Nick Ward, and like Emma said, I grew up near an estuary. Um, yeah, that one's not looking too flashy either, actually, so maybe it's me. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about estuaries. I'm talking about estuaries after lunch. Um, I'm actually going to talk about microbial contamination. I might come down, actually, so I can <coughs> see a bit better and get closer. Um, so we've done quite an extensive program on microbial contamination. We have a river water quality network which measures on a monthly basis water quality. And that's about 60 to 70 sites. We also have a recreational bathing program, which is um, weekly over the summer. So that in South and that goes from December through to March. Um, it's not always like summer. But <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's on a weekly basis of about seven uh, freshwater sites. Uh, there's coastal ones too. But, um, and we have focused on some of those ones with this because um, we're really focused on the land um, affecting um, microbial contamination. So I just want to thank a lot of people who've been involved with this, um, and we've kind of got to the end point, getting to the end point of that, where we actually have some interesting information now. Um, and there's a whole range of other people who've been involved in this process, so thank you to everyone who's, who's contributed. In Southland, um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the MFE uh, swimability package, which is the, the models, um, river networks, and, and kind of what state they're in. Um, and this is actually using the same criteria of our actual data to give you a sense. So we, we got some problems in the south in the sense of human health risks at various sites. So before I go into this, um, it's important to realize that with the technique that we've used, which I'll go into in a second, um, it's really a snapshot and it's a bit of luck. So you have to process the sample in order to get a sense of where it's from, but you don't know what the the concentration of E. coli is at the time. So if it's low, there's obviously not much point in doing that. So we're kind of lucky and there's snapshots. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through this. Um, also, it's, it's really important to be aware that we, where this is really covering sources, but there's um, other aspects. For the sources, there's a sheet <laughs> marker. So we can pick up um, sheet, which is based on Campylobacter, and we can basically say, OK, that's specific to sheep, and we can identify that through um, genetic technique. There's cows as well, so we can pick that up. That doesn't differentiate between beef or cattle, um, dairy, obviously. There's ducks that we can pick up, and actually wild found there's a few more gulls and so on as well, so we can pick up that sense. And there's humans as well. But at the same time, if we know what the sources are, we can get a sense of which hole it's come out of and where it's ended up, but how has it gone from there to there, and that's the pathways, um, which we obviously, you need to kind of figure out and use a bit of um, common sense around too. So the pathways for the same kind of stream, there's effectively tile drains in Southland that can be contributing. You've got um, overland flow, which you can address through things like um, fencing off and uh, riparian planting, and then there's um, direct stock access as well. So in Southland, we have about 250 samples where we've done this technique which is uh, PCR, which is polymerase chain reaction. So basically what it does is take um, genetic material and copy it to the point at which you can then measure how much is in there. Um, and you can do that specifically for different species of, of Campylobacter so that then you can identify those sources. And, and in some situations, such as on the left here with the sheep, it's actually quite so straightforward and you don't really, ne really need um, to do source tracking to figure out what the problem probably is here. Whereas when you've got other systems, like a, a monitoring site here, which is showing some problems, it's obviously a lot more complicated. So to give you some sense of results, um, I put this into a GIS format, so it's spatial. Um, and on the legend here, this is just absence presence. You've got cow, sheep, bird, human. Um, and so we've got that number of sites. So some sites there's one sample, and some there's maybe 17. And it depends whether we got lucky or not, as it were. Um, and you can see that there's a whole range. So I'm going to break that apart a little bit more. And you can click on a site and actually go, well, how many samples were taken? How many times did it come up as this source? And so on. And we obviously have the data, too, that sits behind that. So we can drill down, drill down. So what you can do on this is bear in mind that this PCR copy numbers is this is low, medium, high. Um, 
And you can compare sheep against sheep, but not sheep against cow. Just keep that in mind. But you can start saying, okay, well, where do we have a very strong sheep source? And, okay, well, that's quite interesting. Then you can start looking at some additional information, trying to figure out what's going on there. And you can do the same thing for dairy, uh, for cows too, and get a sense again of, of what we're having. But you can see here that there's a fair range. <laughs> um, and we can also say, okay, is there a human source up for, or not? And in, in, in some of these places, um, again, there may be one sample or so. This was actually a study, a study, a particular study for a subcatchment that we did, that I'll show you in a second. And up here, uh, Riversdale site, which is a recreational bathing site, we had about 17 samples where we did the, the source tracking on, and I think six came off as human sources six times. So in some places, you can actually, we've got enough to say, actually, we've got a problem here, we need to go investigate a little bit more. So, but we can also take this information uh, and like I said, it's that, that, that sub-catchment kind of level, and this was all done on the same day. So this was a longitudinal sampling, taking those um, samples, sending them off, and they all came up relatively high E. coli, and they, sorry, they did vary. And we can start seeing, okay, well, we know there's a wildfowl thing going on here, and somewhere between here and here, we're starting to get these sources. And you can start doing those comparisons, and that's and that can be quite useful. And then we can start putting this some of the background information behind it, like land use. And if you if you have the, even more information, you can start looking at where are the tile drains are. Uh, is there a septic tank nearby, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is potentially quite powerful information if you're getting into investigation space. But you really need to be solving a particular problem at a particular site and focusing right in. So that leads me to the idea, the idea of can you target policy spatially, and that's something, And because that's, or do you need to, should you be looking at implementation more and actually trying to get action on the ground and change and getting that community buying, because unless you get that, you're not going to get any change. Other things to think about is um, antimicrobial resistance, um, I guess before that is also thinking about the source that you have and then the inherent infectiousness of that source. So, for example, a human source is going to be more of a problem at the same concentration as that of cows followed by sheep followed by wildfowl. And there's some work in the States that's looking into that um, quite solid there. And then also thinking about the microbial resistance that may or may not occur within that too. Um, and there's a little bit of work starting to happen in that with um, University of Canterbury, I believe, and, um, and a couple other people are touching on it too, but it's... You know, recognise the sort of World Health Organisation as a big thing looming that's going to be a big challenge for us, and it's going to become a challenge now and in the near future, and it'll continue to do so. Further work um, will be interesting and uh, may help us with pathways is actually looking at that flow separation which we started doing, and geochemical tracing. So the idea of that is can you get a sense of that pathway? Does it have a signature of a, a soil um, signature or overland flow signature? And that information is also sitting with those samples, so we can potentially go back and mine and harvest that a bit more, give us a sense of pathways. Going forwards, well, coming right back to the theme of integration, um, it's important to think about that every site is different, and you need to use context here. Modeling may or may not be useful, depending on the situation. The source tracking may or may not be useful, depending on the situation. And there may be a whole bunch of other information, land use, and so on. Spatial information is really important to making decisions, but it's really important to not lose common sense in all of that and actually um, think about it in a kind of who done it sort of way. It's a process of elimination more than a process of identification. And also, the other thing is microbial, or as in swimming or swimmability, is really just the tip of the iceberg. But it's a great segue into community conversations because it's actually a thing that people are quite passionate about and they can easily understand and it's a great way to start those conversations to then start talking about this is not just about microbial, this is about biodiversity, this is about cyanobacteria issues, this is about um, stream health, this is about time of species. There's a whole much bigger picture going on here. Um, and I think, but I think this is a great way of starting that conversation. Thanks for listening.